Um, yeah, Stefan and I, we have known each other for a while. Um, he is the director of civil engineering, so his background is also civil engineering and hydrology within a firm that is basically doing urban design and landscape architecture. It's the office of Dreiseitel in Überlingen. And um, so Stefan, he, he is um, specializing in water systems and hydrology connected to eco-water management, connected to water circulation and also different types of water cleaning methods. And they have the big benefit to have really an integrated team even within one office, which is still very rare. I don't understand why there are so few offices working in that way, because for this kind of project it seems something so natural to do. Um, but I think the Dreiseutel office in that respect is really quite unique. And they have done very um, uh, well-received projects. They won many, many international awards and they are at the moment also having several offices um, in Überlingen, not only in Überlingen, but also in Singapore and in Portland and in Beijing. Um, yeah, so I will not now tell too much, but um, yeah, we are very happy that you made it and we are now really looking forward to seeing your projects to give us some inspiration for the next days of what can be achieved if we integrate green infrastructure and water uh, management. Thank you very much for the invitation. I want to start my presentation uh, with some insight of Atelier Dreiseitel, which was founded in uh, 1980, around 1980, by Mr. Dreiseitel. And this is uh, our team, uh, or our three teams. So we have a base in Überlingen at the Lake of Constance. Then we have a base in Singapore since 2010, and also the same in, in uh, Beijing, and at the moment, at the, so this year actually we arrived in each uh, offices the same amount or uh, um, yes, the amount of people or uh, planners and architects and engineers, and uh, so altogether we are about 75 uh, planners, and they are it is a mixture of. Uh, architects, as I said already, landscape architects mainly, but we have also building architects, we have engineers, civil engineers like me, I'm a civil engineer with specialization in water, and then we have also some special kind of architects which switch actually to water, uh, and this is a very international team. So, for instance, in, in Singapore, this team here, they are a mixture, I mean, Singapore itself is a mixture of different cultures, but also our team represent actually this mixture from uh, from Thailand, from Indonesia, from from uh, of course from from the main, from from uh, Singapore, and uh, some from England, from US, and some German also. So also in in, in Überlingen, we are a mixed team from different cultures, and this is actually what gives us a special uh, taste of creati creativity, creativity. And also in, in China, in Beijing, we have at least uh, three guys or five from abroad. Uh, but of course, this is a big, very big country and the, the network uh, of the Atelier Dreiseite in Beijing is mainly based in, in China also. So they are not so much working abroad. But from Überlin, we can, yeah, we jump to, for instance, to Abu Dhabi at the moment. There is uh, not really a base yet, but since we are a member of the Rumble Group and the Rumble Company, uh, two years ago we, uh, we moved into that big uh, engineering company, company from Copenhagen. We have also there a strong connection, or a stronger connection than before. We did already some projects in all of these continents, and uh, with these strengths, we can also uh, yeah, step into bigger, I would say not bigger projects, but bigger challenges of projects and bigger dimensions also of projects. At the moment, we are engaged in the Master City project by the client of, uh, of Master City together with Rumble. So we are trying there to uh, uh, refine actually the, the urban master plan 
which was done in the beginning 10 years before by Foster Architects. And there was also built a block around, around uh, five hectares big. And uh, it turned out that because of the financial crisis, it was not manageable actually to continue this project. So the client decided to do a um, more or less normal master plan. And there have been five, no, four steps of master planning. And now we are somehow the fifth step to uh, bring more sustainability again on the on this uh, plot. Then we have uh, from Singapore, for instance, the Singaporeans, they are covering somehow the Southeast Asia region with projects in, in, in Malaysia, in uh, Thailand, in um, also in the, in the South region of China, for instance. There are also some relationship because the government of Singapore is now also sailing projects, and not government, but private companies, sailing projects to, to China and to the southeastern region. So they also bring their planners and their architects to other regions. And this is how we get also into new projects. Then, of course, we have uh, a long tradition with water in Germany and in Europe. So Mr. Dreisaitl is the founder of Atelier Dreisaitl. He actually turned out of the Atelier Dreisaitl and is now, uh, or he started actually a new business. It's, it's called uh, Livable City Lab, which is also based in Überlingen, next to our office. So he is now working upstairs there. And this is our office here. And yeah, you see all uh, people are there standing and looking at experiments, water experiments, which we are usually doing once a year or twice a year. It depends on how many new people we have. And this is also the base of our work. And I want just to give you some impressions. What is for us the, the base of our work when we do water or when we, plan, when we are planning water systems? We are studying before we do a planet and planning um, sketch or uh, doing a, a drawing. We are studying the behavior of water, and behavior of water is important to understand in the microcosm, but also to transfer these ideas into the macrocosm. And this means that we can understand the dynamic and also the flexibility of water better, and we can also bring that into our design and also to our functions of our systems. And we try to understand also uh, what is water needing to get its best expression and also its best uh, quality. Because this is one of our goals to, pre to provide uh, excellent design solutions. And this is what you see here. Um, yeah, the water itself is a very fine artist. So you can see here some images where we create vortexes and we make them visible. Everybody can do it actually. We just put some powder on top of the water and then you just draw through a, a brush and then you create already this type or this nice uh, peak, uh, patterns. And also drawing by hand is still uh, the main work of our design. And we are doing a lot of integrated work. And as you see also here, it, it is some kind of a chaotic system but it is a nice and a beautiful system. And so we try to transfer, transfer actually these ideas also into our built land, landscape and planned landscapes. So you see here natural landscapes. So in a the meander uh, carved in, in, a, in a glacier, then in this amazing lands, landscape in, uh, in the middle west of US, uh, canyon landscape also carved by water and big energies, and then also from a bigger viewpoint, uh, from a far viewpoint, you can see here these nice river, rivers, how they meander in very natural landscapes, and this is our inspiration. So this is what we think is the real nature and what people should also get to know in the urban fabric. Not only that they have to travel long distances, and yeah, we can now more into the practical uh, work. So we are doing also river design in our workshop with clay. And this is not just to form the clay. It has also a background. So before we start this work, 
we think about how water can go through without withstand and without uh, resistance and to make not only a nice meander but also to, to see how much how much play is needed really in this in this uh, outer uh, lines and also in, also in the inner lines and then when the pump going on then we can cut down some material and we can optimize the system. This is also how we work. It is not just uh, ready design, designed by hand and then the sketch is always going through the, the same way in, in the project. We are always doing some circles to refine our ideas. And finally, we end up also in Stuttgart. And uh, this year, we could open our first project in the city center of Stuttgart. It's in this new uh, development of, of the uh, Europa, uh, Europe center. And before we did this project, we had, uh, yeah, we came into this project by a competition, uh, which we won. And then we had to give some uh, lectures, and we wanted also to integrate the, uh, the people and the uh, yeah, inhabitants of Stuttgart. And we suggested to integrate the youth and the, the pupils because this these generation will somehow be responsible later also for these structures which we are building. So we can say in 50 years uh, the, uh, the city is changing, or 50% of the city state is, will be changed or removed or somehow Changed so this generation is somehow uh, accompanying actually this process from the beginning, from the design process to the building process, and then also in operation. And then they we we know from other projects and also from studies, and you are also a university who is doing studies like that. That people are more engaged and also more feeling more responsible for this type of projects when they have been involved from the beginning. And these type of water experiments. We, did, we do in our workshop, but we do also outside. So these are very simple tools, what you need to make the phenomena of water movements visible. And here in the background, you see already our design, uh, winning design uh, for the Mailena Plaza and, uh, next to in the neighborhood here. And when you see how it worked out in the on the end, so we are also using rainwater there. The rainwater is collected from this roof. Uh, we couldn't get more because the project was already too far. Uh, the, the new library is here on this side. So the, the planning process has been started already five years before. And as it was, still is the normal thing that landscape is just an element uh, to, to um, what do you call it? Uh, uh, just to decorate the, the final uh, plat or the final uh, uh, surface, yeah, the perfect surface. And that means to bring an infrastructure like for a fountain, for water, or to use stormwater was on the end a bit too late. Yeah? You could have much more rainwater and could also have more use of rainwater if we, or if there would be some kind of master plan for water management. And Stuttgart has got also problems with water management. We know all, we all know that. And also uh, the city knows that, but there's some kind of lack how to, how to do the master planning and also how to integrate it. Because a lot of things has to, this, the, has to be discussed. You have to measure, uh, yeah, you have to measure some how, how much water you have to store, for instance, here to to have a resilient city and to reduce the flooding rates and all the, the runoff rates. And then you have also to find someone who is caring for such a water system. I mean, here the idea is actually, well, the idea was to bring some green into this campus and also some water, in. so green and blue, because this is, these are the I would say the key principles of uh, sustainable or livable city. And this scape is, of course, a very hard scape. When you go there and, and you think, oh, there's a lot of cover and a lot of ceiling of the surface, but you know, this, this has been done anyway. And we try to, I would say, to use this space and 
just to show the people that there is water and that it is possible to have water in the middle of the, of the town or of the urban area, mm -hmm. and even to use storm water for this, to, to run this uh, system, and at the same time also to have some trees. In the whole uh, Europa center, there is actually no tree. It was forgotten. We don't know. So that was also one of the big discussions. Why do we have the uh, trees? Actually, the city of Stuttgart said, oh, it, too, it's, it, make, it makes too much maintenance work. Also, the water was not, not really in the budget, because these are extra costs of 500,000 euro, and this has to be somehow fundraised. But finally, they did it with the help of the developer, who is um, uh, uh, coming from Hamburg. It's, um, I miss the name now. It's one of the biggest uh, mall developers in Germany. And actually, they haven't got, haven't got any idea that stormwater use makes sense. And that this could be also help their project to get some credit points and lead or for the DGNB uh, certification. And finally, I think they get also some points and they like actually this idea. Um, and we, we just felt, I mean, we are working in this field of water management and creative uh, integration into the uh, cityscape since 30 years. And still we feel that there's still a lack of information or the, the knowledge for, uh, on, the, on the side of developers and even on the side of, of the city. What is possible, what is makeable, what is necessary actually to, uh, to beautify a city and also to attract the city, to make it more attractive. So our office has also got the ability to uh, make the infrastructure planning. So this is also something very special. Uh, Mr. Dreisaitl's idea was actually not only to have good ideas, but also to bring them into practice. So he looked for the experts he needed to do that. So he looked for me, for instance. I, I called them and then I thought, okay, it's the landscape architecture office, why do I need an engineer? So in the beginning, it was uh, 20 years ago, uh, years ago, I thought, yes, uh, maybe it's, it's much too specialized, uh, they, don't, they can't need actually an engineer. But in this, in this time, we were engaged in different big projects, like the Charlotte Park was one of the biggest um, uh, settlements or the residential areas in the south of, yeah, of Germany. Then the Kronzberg uh, the Expo project, was one of the biggest projects also in this time in, in, in Germany. Then Berlin, Potsdam, Berlin, Potsdam Plaza. So all these big infrastructure projects, or where a lot of infrastructure has been built, and at the same time also the, was the turn of the century, where the government and the politicians needed pilot projects to show that uh, ecological uh, developments are possible also in this time already and to convince the politicians, the, I would say the local politicians, the stakeholders, the developers and also the engineers, the other engineers that water is somehow a very, uh, a very tre uh, high treasure which we should keep and, and use. So this is a double, a double um, how to say, uh, Double shock. Uh, double level, double level, the technical loop, plant loop, uh, and so in the basement we store the, the rainwater, uh, the the, the uh, turnover water or the circulated water is stored somewhere here, and on top we have this uh, wedged wire screen, which is a very smart system to an effective system to to treat the the water and. We know it also from, from other projects, a lot of garbage and, and uh, trash and also leaves, for instance, it's always a problem to get rid of them and not to block actually the, the outlets and this is a perfect system. This was also new for the city of, of, of Stuttgart, so the uh, Rodenmeister, the, the master of the fountains of Stuttgart, he was very interested to install this and to see how it works. And what is also good to, to know in Stuttgart, for instance, all fountains, we didn't know that, are only treated once in the beginning of a four-week uh, rhythm. After four weeks, they uh, completely exchange the water because it gets dirtier and dirtier. And they, uh, they avoid any chemical treatment. They use some kind of 
uh, treatment against the algae growing. But you will see also in this fountain, once uh, there is a biofilm on the surface, on the hard surface, and it's not really good uh, brushed and cleaned, then on this biofilm you can see also algae is growing. But this is a question of operation and maintenance work. And uh, we did also in the beginning of the, for the first period of Atinidase, we didn't use any chemical treatment. Then we had a period where we had to use, and still in some cities it is also a duty to do. But we know also from one of our projects where they had an accident with chloride. And so I'm still uh, a bit resistant against using chemicals. I like this system here because it has a pure mechanical filtration. Okay, they use some kind of, of um, anti-algae um, yeah, implementation in the beginning, but finally it is just a, puring, uh, yeah, a simple curing system. And yeah, I, I started already to show you our working our workshop, and this is also how we start our projects. So most, mostly, we are not waiting until the design uh, is <coughs> more far away or more uh, uh, progress is has progress more. We start already with with uh, uh, modeling in the beginning to get an idea, also to get an idea of the dimension of the force. And sometimes we are doing also water tests, also for this uh, for the for, for this project we did water tests in our workshop, so we can do one-to-one -one models and to see how it works. And yeah, finally you see this was the model for the competition, and this is how it looks like today. So actually, it's not such a big thing; it's just a, a pattern of of, um, I would say, some kind of slopes, uh, natural stones. And uh, on the end also the, of the day, the water is emptied out. So this area is also used or usable for pedestrians. And we also put some, uh, yeah, some stones in here to create a water pattern, which shows somehow the, the nice flowing water. Yeah. So you will find these type, type of patterns in a lot of our projects. It's not just to have a water carpet, but also to make something visible. And then we have also some other play uh, in interactive tools there where children can play, where adults can play, some fountains, some muzzles, some, uh, yeah, some kind of uh, operating uh, play water play. And on the other side, we put the benches here, which is also a meeting point, and we saw already that this is also very accepted and very good in use. So in warm days, there is also the sun, and people can have a rest there, looking on the fountain, people, uh, children playing there, and also at night, it is a nice feature. And then one of our colleagues, he liked to install also a big uh, swing, so this is some kind of, of a special thing, but it's also nice just to relax at this point and to, yeah, to, uh, yeah, to have this nice feature in this nice uh, surrounding. Nevertheless, we have actually still big problems to solve. And this is always the change I mean, when we build and we look out and we see there's actually a nice landscape and buildings are all in function, the, the infrastructure is in function, the streets are good maintained, our uh, water is there in the toilets and at home and at the tap. And, but we know already from different ex um, events, uh, especially just a uh, pure uh, uh, precipitation or a rain event, that in some regions we have serious problems and big damages. And the question is really, are we prepared for that? I mean, we as Atelier we say, yes, of course. We, we know all this, uh, um, we know, know all the, the, the laws, natural laws, how it works, how the water cycle works, the, the global, the local water cycle. And we also have the tools, actually. There's a good market of uh, environment, environmental tools in Germany, for instance, so you know where to buy a cistern, how to build a green roof, 
and also how to build a virus way. I think the knowledge is there. What is somehow missing, I stated already, is the implementation and also some kind of, not only that we have, I think we have also the right laws, but what is missing somehow is that, yeah, we have to start to do it, yeah. It is some, sometimes you, you think you, you have to convince someone, actually he knows, but he can't change his attitude or his, his decision. And this is uh, somehow a problem. I mean, the nature also helps us a bit, uh, and also the scientists helps us to make it more visible what happens around the globe, what kind of climate change uh, we have to face in the future. And I found this nice feature, uh, uh, image, in the, of course, in the internet, showing the, the peak uh, daily or yeah, the daily, the average daily precipitation around the globe. And you see, of course, around the equator you have regular rain. And then also our uh, northern hemisphere here has some rain. And then also in this region here, I think this belongs also to the equator. This is the region uh, where also all these typhoons are happening every year, so there is a lot of water moving around. And uh, we know also that climate change and water and uh, <coughs> the evaporation water in the, in the atmosphere, they have, there is a very close relationship. And what we do also in small scale on, yeah, in, a, in a town, in a, in a city, has also an uh, influence of, on, on the global uh, water cycle, but also in the local water cycle. And the statement is actually that we have to increase the evaporation rates from our cities. When you look out, there's rarely some green to see. So trees have got the biggest evaporation rates, grass maybe 50%, and roads, I think, maybe 2% or so. It depends on how porous, how, how, how much is the porosity. And we think that if you can use as much as possible of the area to infiltrate or to store water and to, to uh, evaporate, then you can also solve some of these problems, what we are facing. This was, for instance, the, the big cloud during the 2002 flood of the River Elbe. And uh, you see somehow whole Europe is some, somehow covered. And at this point, we have the biggest rates that have been needed per square meter rates. And on, on this one day where all this flooding uh, caused, were caused actually by this, just one rain event. And yeah, the, as I said already, we know somehow we are, we can't change the climate change. We can have a change on the watershed, maybe not on the topography, but on the porosity and also on the uh, ceiling factor. And of course, the land use and urbanization, we, cannot, we have also under our control. So a lot of factors where we can do something and to actually reduce the runoff and also control the floodings and the pollution. This is somehow what we see as our task as landscape architects, but also as engineers. And yeah, this is somehow our current experience. We, we know and we can see how the clouds are coming and how the rain is falling and we see also how flooding happens every year now. So last year we had a big flood in the River Elbe again in, a, in another area of Germany, not in the upper layer, uh, upstream, but uh, more downstream, downstream area. And infrastructure has been influenced by that, so the trains couldn't go, I think, for three months or four months between Berlin and, and Hanover. Then the roads are uh, suffering somehow, and a lot of costs are behind that. And yeah, the Copenhagen example is also important because this is somehow one of the game changers in Denmark. So at the moment, Denmark is looking or is focusing the politicians. They did already decisions. They raised actually the flooding or the service level of flooding of roads for instance, from 10 years to 100 years. And they have to follow and they have to prepare cloud burst strategies for each city or each bigger city, I would say. And I have been to a conference in Copenhagen uh, four weeks ago, and I could also see some of these projects, what they started now was to build as pilot projects. 
And I think uh, Germany has got much more projects and could could already show much more than the than the Danish. But they have somehow they got this this event and this is still still active. So they somehow afraid to have this event every year. So they are really curious about doing something and also to change not only politics but also decision makers, also to change the, the mind of, mindset of private people because the private ownership is very important in this point. It's not possible only to change the public infrastructure. You have to take on board also the private owners and the stakeholders it, because it's a problem of the cashing area. It's a problem of the area and not only of transportation and conveyance and uh, re uh, restore or storing in, in the public areas. I mean, these pictures are taken from the lowest area in Copenhagen. So that means these are the connecting points somehow from the whole catchment. And I, I think these pictures can help also to convince people which are not directly suffering from this flooding and living outside of this uh, catchment base. And, but also contributing their runoff into this uh, cache And And yeah, you, you can see some, some numbers here, some figures. It was a 1,000 year rain event, okay. No infrastructure can handle that, actually. But we can say, if we know about this, we can also make our plans for the future. Our master plan can say, okay, we need some flooding rules. Points. I will show later somehow a bit uh, how this Cloudburst uh, program in Copenhagen is going through. Then also in other um, in other continents like in we know as we know or as we have their uh, uh, office we also know about these events more now and our colleagues can send us pictures and uh, we try also to, to collect all these pictures to have a database and to make this always visible to clients and also to politicians because this is very helpful otherwise people can forget actually. The event was last summer, but I think this summer is something other important thing, and you wouldn't think about this anymore. So this is actually also how how it works. And yes, uh, in Hamburg we have been also part of the RISA project, the Rainwater Infrastructure Adaptation Program, to communicate actually the program, the master planning for the next decade. And one of these images I just took out and showed here. So uh, from the radar, you can very good. Uh, it's very good to see that the rain is somehow uh, raining, or big rain events are also here hitting the, the city center of Hamburg in 2012, and also there, big damage actually started a process. Yeah, 2009 they started the process of doing a cloudburst master plan. <coughs> And also there we tried to get some pilot projects also to help Hamburg to uh, implement this. But we also see that this is a very tough and a hard field, actually. So a lot of different interests, political, political boundaries uh, are different from the catchment boundaries. And so a lot of communication is needed actually to start this project also to do some positive change. But there are some projects and they are also good. And uh, <coughs> other factors is not only that we increase the, or that we get, have to get, or that we have to consider more intensity, rate intensity, but also more heat and uh, droughts, problems with heat and droughts in the cities. So this brings me to the topic of green. Uh, green is something which uh, can pro provide shadow. Green is also something what can soak water and retain water and evaporate. So to reduce the heat effect, it is very easy actually to make the city nice with a lot of trees. And you need space, of course. So finally, um, we have to change our land use. Or we change our land use and now we see the results and now we have to change again our land use. So it's always some kind of circle. We see what happens when we do something in, in our nature and our uh, urban escapes. And we see also how much does it cost to repair. And now we can take this amount of money to invest in different type of infrastructure. 
we're facing, we are facing also problems. Maybe this is not really caused by climate change. It's depending on how, from which viewpoint you can look. If the, the, the divide of, of these is somehow maybe also because of um, poisons in the, in the environment and in agriculture. But for instance, in China, they do already the uh, uh, yeah. the brunation, yeah, with 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 some uh, with hand by hand, yeah. So it's amazing what what people how they adapt actually to this change. Yeah. So about the cost, I talked already. I will just put over. And I found a very interesting study. Actually, it was done already in 1998. Uh, and actually there was a comparison of, or they tried to find out whether the, the rain intensities are increasing. And yeah, finally they found that there is some kind of increase and the, the, they measured it in the, in the return period. So the return periods of very strong rains is somehow uh, decreasing, that means the, it, it happens more often. The same rain demand will come, uh, or will rain more often than before. And you see here that there are some kind of increasing in, for instance, in the US, uh, up to 160%. And in Europe, is not shown actually. And in India, there's also got some increase. So maybe there's a lack of research in Germany. See, but I think nowadays maybe we can have it after 10 years. And uh, then we have also, or in, this, in this study, we found also these trends, which uh, shows actually from the perspective of the insurance companies and reinsurance companies how much costs these, um, these damages and these, these natural catastrophes actually cause us. And with this cost, also again here, we can do some change in the infrastructure and also in our street and uh, cityscapes. Yeah, I'm just coming now to the existing uh, structures we have. I mean, these are very big and huge projects, like here in the Ura Valley and the Ura, Ura uh, area. But we also know that there is a lot of a, a strong organization behind to change even such a big system. Yeah. So the uh, Genossenschaft is, I think, the biggest employer in Germany. And they uh, collect water and treat water from a very big area, not only from which city, but from a very big area. And they get also a lot of money from, uh, from the pay per cubic meter money. So it's also a running or a, yeah, a steady income, actually. And they have the ability also to change something. And the Rovali, I won't show it tonight, uh, this night here or this evening. Um, the Rovali has did a lot of progress and also a lot of pilot projects. And they have the route of rainwater directly at the River Emsche. And they have a river uh, restoration project where they want to restore actually the River Emsche and to take out all the wastewater. I think this has been done somehow. Then they have a program, they say 50% of the rainwater should be decoupled from the mixture system within 50 years. I think at the moment uh, they started this program in 2002 or 2001. We have been also involved in one of these pilot projects. And uh, I think maybe they have to extend, extend actually this 50 year rain, but they are on the track to do something. And yeah, this brings me up again to, to the big discussion we have every day. How much does it cost? Is it, is it possible to, to bring it in a, in a, an, in a rendita, which where the return comes back in five years, for instance. Yeah. So we have to prove, to make proof to the developers that the investment into green infrastructure or blue-green infrastructure has a, got a, the same return as the current infrastructure. And I think this is not possible because uh, we have to touch more areas. It's not just a single line what we are building. 
we have to touch more areas, and of course, the cost on an area is bigger actually than just to drill the conveyor's pipe. But we also know that the cost to repair actually, to cleanse the air, to cleanse the water, and this is a public task on the end. So if the sewer company is throwing the wastewater or the cleansed wastewater, which is not 100% clean, into the sea or into the lake or into the rivers, we have a constant increase of pollutants in our rivers, and it's not possible to take a bath in the river. I mean, in Germany we had, we did a lot of investment, and now we have good quality in the Lake of Constance. And also in the River Rhine, at the moment, I think you can take a bath, and also the summits coming back. So, but there were also a lot of investments to do that. And we have maybe to do more invest also to solve the other problems. And we know also from other regions, that they are at the beginning actually to do some kind of infrastructure and to sell them, I would say, not up-to-date technologies like uh, big infrastructure tunnels and systems which are making the people somehow dependent on that. This is something where we would do a question behind. So we, can, we think in these regions they also want to develop and to progress in their life side and their livability. I think we should bring them really the, the latest uh, the latest yeah, findings and also the latest uh, ecological viewpoints. So what can we do? This is a big question. We think that infrastructure, innovative blue-green infrastructure, which is somehow the title of this speech, is only one part of the, of the answer. We think that all together, we call it livable cities. I think this is the word which comes from uh, US somehow. And we have some other components which yeah, sounds like the definition of sustainability. But we think that this is somehow a circle of very different uh, solutions and also thoughts and also a lot of different interests and stakeholders which has to be invited on one table to talk about the best solution what innovative blue green infrastructure would be in a special situation. So we can't say there's one formula and this is always guilty. No, we have actually to go and see what the place where people live, what is the, the cultural answer, the answer of culture, what is the answer of uh, nature and environmental protection, what is the answer of urban design, and then also to ask the engineers, what do you need actually to fulfill your task? And we think that this circle has to be the basic principle to start a project. For instance, the City Hall of Chicago was one of the pilot projects to promote green roofs in the US. So now I, I think it was built in 2000 or 1999. And now I think the industry of green roof construction, and so I think it's a, a running system. It's not necessary to have such a project anymore. Also in Germany not, even in China not. Everybody knows about the system, but when you look on the top of the roofs, it's very rare to see projects where they really use also green roofs in a, in a bigger scale. I know from Hamburg that they, because of this uh, rain, uh, rainwater infrastructure adaptation program, because to make a green roof is, on the end, a very easy infrastructure tool because it's yeah, just a roof. You need not to dig out some holes. It's not underground, it's on top. And most of all, everybody can do it. So you can donate and you can sponsor the people. You can give some money to, to uh, a hand cell to build and to, uh, yeah, to build green roofs. And the effect is quite good. So politicians already know that green roof is a very good tool. But still, I think it's not, not, not enough to see. And uh, what is nice to be seen here, or also here, that the mayor, he actually keeps his bees on top of this uh, Chicago City Hall, and he also scales his honey. So it's pure organic honey. And uh, we know already from some studies that the variety and the biodiversity in cities is much bigger than in our agricultural lands because a lot of motor culture happens there 
and we destroy all these hatches and all these small structures. And we have a, lot, a much bigger uh, uh, biodiversity in cities. And I mean, all this movement of urban farming and urban gardening, and people are like doing gardening in the city, I think this is uh, the, the good direction. And also, I think the bees, they don't suffer in the city so much like in agriculture, where they, where they use fertilizers and chemicals. And uh, so I know from some uh, friends in Berlin, for instance, they have their bees on the, on the balcony. Yeah. Um, just before I come into the other projects, I showed already some projects now. Uh, yeah, we think that the infrastructure has to be nice. And we know also from history that in past times, the engineers knew already, already about that, that they would have to work together with an architect or with a designer. And on the left side, you see uh, some kind of sunken palace, we call it. It's a big system in, in uh, Istanbul where they store uh, drinking water for the viaducts in, in, in the old Romic uh, Empire. Empire. And I like actually this project uh, where they turned directly on a huge plant, the biggest huge plant of, of uh, Swiss uh, in uh, four of these, of these big ponds uh, or basins. There were no use anymore for them. And so they, instead of demolishing or decommissioning them, they just uh, built one in a, in a fish pond, another one in a natural pond, and a uh, natural pool where you can swim in without using chemicals. And then they did also cost compare, and they said, okay, instead of uh, throwing eight millions away to decommission this uh, basins, we invest just 8.5 millions to restore and to have also at the same time some kind of a spa. So I think this is an extreme example how you can see uh, what is the best solution in a place. But I think it's a very good sign. And you see also the reaction of the people who are working there uh, who understand the German, that is the less expensive, that's the most coolest project they, they ever saw or what they can imagine. So we see a lot of potentials to change our cityscapes, and we know also about the principles that uh, Antje maybe introduced already what kind of principles uh, we have. Uh, just to give you just uh, an overview how we approach the project, so we say the context of the urban structures is very important to give also the right answer what kind of infrastructure is needed. So we define somehow these different typologies of building and plot scale, soft, soft, soft scapes and waterways, parking and roads and plazas. These are the, I would say, most common infrastructures which are to be seen. And these are all the, the toolbox, the process, what happens there, and all <coughs> the characteristics, uh, what we, how we define actually the green infrastructure. And just to give you a some images, what do we understand with green streets, with integrated green infrastructure? We think that the open drainage system, this is uh, the importance. I mean, we can see a lot of projects in Germany and also in other countries where they put a lot of infrastructure, again, underground. Even infiltration trenches and storage tanks, it's all underground structure. But we think it needs to come on the surface. And this has, of course, a deeper change in, in the whole organization of infrastructure. You have to have open downspouts, you have to open actually your road, you have to give space in the road for the water. And uh, in the plaza, of course, it's more, open, uh, more common. And you can see such a project in nearly every city. Even on uh, parking lots, I think it's also more common to use per permeable per pavement and also open conveyance or infiltration system in biostates. And also in the landscape, you have a lot of space. It's much easier to integrate. So I think the toughest point is somehow the road infrastructure and the dense cities. How much space we need. And also on, on roofs and on facades and uh, sidewalks, we can do a lot. Um, 
I just put in here these images from New York uh, or from US. Uh, they jumped on, on this train and in every big city they produce such a manual for road runoff treatment or stormwater treatment on private plots. And they did it in a very good way that they also try to to show that there's a cost benefit. Yeah? This is actually the big discussion. Of course, in the beginning, the, uh, it takes it takes maybe in the beginning a bit more money to invest into the green infrastructure, but finally it ends up that the difference of, of the results, so the, the benefits when, when you give them also costs in reducing the uh, combined sewer overflows, in reducing, uh, I would say, uh, pollutants in rivers, I think that on the end the cost of uh, green blue infrastructure is lower than the gray infrastructure. <coughs> Yes, just to show you now some of these uh, great projects we did. Uh, Harbor in, in Frankfurt, right? uh, in uh, Offenbach, near Frankfurt, which used to be um, an industrial area. So nowadays they yeah, removed actually this industrial use and they installed their residential use, which has a very high, uh, yeah, I would say, value and also the to buy a flat there is very expensive. So there's potential also to bring in green blue infrastructure. At this point where people also spend money, more money maybe than in other places, but I think what I, what I said, said before, it's not really depending on uh, who is living there and who is spending money. I think it's just the, the, to find the right answer on the right place. So you can also, you can have also I would say more simpler blue green infrastructure is easier to install and also cost more and cost efficient uh, tools in a, in a different place where maybe the investment is not so big. But I think this type of project is showing, or these are the type of projects are showing also masterpieces that it's possible also here to use green roofs and to bring in green infrastructure in combination of of landscape design. So here we treat very simply the road runoff before it goes into the canal and into the river mine. And uh, yeah, I think it's just, we need the space, we have to make the plans for that. And then the water is infiltrated through and it's also some kind of a nice feature and uh, visible and you make the water visible. Then the Cloudburst project in Copenhagen uh, started already before this big uh, event in 2011 and it was just accelerated by this big event and they did already a lot of analysis uh, about the rising of sea level but, but also about the uh, flooding areas and the risky zones where the, the water level will rise higher than 50 centimeters and this is combined on the end also with uh, insurance uh, um, uh, somehow estimation, which means what kind of values you have here in these areas, what you have to protect, and then they uh, counter calculated actually how much they have to invest to, to protect every single house, or to use this money to do something in the broader catchment area. And this is actually our idea also of these um, program of the Cloud Cloudburst Cloud program, it must be a combination of decentralized stormwater management and resistance and uh, safety measurements and also with some kind of infrastructure tools. So bigger canals or reopening of old canals. And these are somehow the, uh, the, the flood routes which were uh, calculated and because of topography and also because of catchment. And then we went into this, each of these lines we went in a, into, uh, on a bicycle through, through, through Copenhagen and we had a look on the existing infrastructure where could be placed to store and to uh, delay actually the storm on a runoff on the surface. Because here we are talking about uh, the overland flow, so it's not the everyday rain. But finally we have to discuss also the everyday rain because when we do some kind of change of the surface, then you have also to change somehow the existing infrastructure. 
And the first thing what Copenhagen did is, as I said already, rising the service level from 10 year to 100 year, which means they have to rise all the curb stores. And if they don't want to do that, they have to do measurements, what they can do in a, in a decentralized way. And this is just the city center of uh, Copenhagen, but in every uh, outer catchment area of uh, Copenhagen, they also do the same. So, uh, yeah, we give some ideas where to store the water, for instance here. This is uh, used to be a, a, a water supply pond system, and since 20 years or so, it's not used anymore, it's just a recreational area. And we said, why don't you lower actually the water level, and you create here a big storage plain, which is adjacent actually here to this flooding area with uh, high volume, a lot of high rise and also valuable uh, buildings are sitting here and what is very, uh, yeah, I, I think for us it was very clear, this area is much lower than this, this reservoir. So of course you should lower the reservoir to protect actually this area. Very simple answer somehow. But they are still discussing whether they can do that and how they do that and when. But I think we just brought the, the, the ball in, into roll, rolling and now they have to discuss and find somehow the decision. We did also some very, very extravagant, I would say, uh, suggestion, which is also from the cost side, of course, expensive. You have to touch all the infrastructure in these roads and it will take also a lot of time. But we said, okay, it's a master plan and you can put in everything, every idea is welcomed to make visible what is possible also in existing instructions. And I think here, this is this might be more easier, and this change might be easier to do. Uh, yeah, it's just an existing park stripe in, in the road, and you just have to, to change a bit the, the, the slope direction, and you just, uh, before it was up rise, and now you just uh, lower actually this area, and in a temporary cloudless flooding, this voice also as a flood, uh, flood region. And even on roads, on border roads, traffic can go still, uh, still go, go through. And here we can also create some kind of a natural river, just temporary. Another project where the master plan was asked by us is the Civic Square in San Francisco. And it is some kind of a, um, was an interesting project from the beginning because, yeah, you can look at New York, you can look at Los Angeles and or in Portland. They did already a lot of uh, changing infrastructure, but San Francisco yet had no real idea what is, what is their story about sustainability. And the civic uh, should be the starting point to do that. And of course, we are looking also here back into history and the culture, what it has to, used to be. And it used to be somehow always during the big uh, earthquakes and also during wars somehow a, a, a collecting point for people to rescue there and to, yeah, to be safe there because in the surrounding it used to be that there were not so many buildings who can collapse. So people were safe to stay there. Yeah? And we took actually this idea and to say, okay, be prepared for the next earthquake and do, these are the stakeholders somehow, and do something where you can be independent of water supply, wastewater management, energy supply. This is actually the, the key idea, how to change this, or what could be a, an idea, how to change this uh, square, the city square. And not, not to start, see, oh, actually, maybe here we have to also decouple, do some green rooms here. No, we, we just concentrate on this civic square, and we say, okay, what is possible there? Yeah? You should not do the, the scale too big. I mean, sometimes it's good, but in this case, maybe it's not, not good, because to change this infrastructure here, it's too expensive, actually. And here, they want to do a change anyway, and uh, yes, I think there might be something possible. So, as I described already, zero water, zero wastewater, means just to be independent, not not use any more water and energy, but just to be independent from the public system. And what is already done is that they 
upgrade already the energy uh, the dependency, so they installed a lot of uh, PV and uh, they have also refurbished and uh, upgraded their, their tap systems and yeah, a lot of water is safe now also in these private homes and this could be somehow the goal how to reduce the, the baseline of annual imported water demand and this is a master plan for the next 30 years so it is also the same for the energy consumption reducing that and we try to bring this water cycle this artificial water cycle in some nice uh, graphics and patterns this is the current supply and consumption and we see a lot of potential in uh, recycling of sewage of grey water separation of on sewage treatment on the site on in groundwater usage and um, yeah we also designed already some kind of an infrastructure system where you can make visible how this plaza can be used on top but also what happens underneath in, in the um, underground So this is the last project I will show you, and I hope you will enjoy it. Uh, this is the telecom park in Taipei, where we have to deal with daily rain, which is the same amount like the cloudburst event in Copenhagen. So they have to deal with that every day. And when you would compare, I didn't do that now here in this presentation, but if you compare infrastructure from uh, Asia with European, then of course you can see a uh, difference of the scales. So they use a lot of box trains, they use a lot of um, yeah, big infrastructure tools, they have a much den more denser, more, the high density of systems to convey the water. And yeah, still, they also convey a lot of water into the rivers. The rivers are highly polluted. They don't have a really a good, uh, I would say, on the area. Or on the broader area, a good uh, wastewater treatment strategy. Each plot has to deal with its, its own wastewater somehow. It's some kind of um, non-conforming, non-conforming uh, fault uh, system. And the the owner of this plot is uh, one of the biggest uh, building companies of uh, Taiwan. And it used to be a golf course. And he said, okay. We want to bring, uh, give Taipei actually a very high value uh, development for mixed use, so living and commercial, and so working and living at the same place. And he invited also an international team of architects and infrastructure planners to uh, actually create the cityscape and the urban design. So we started here from a green area and we could actually design as we want. So we invited also some architects. And uh, then we found, and we, we had a look on the topography and we found that this is the deepest point. And uh, the, the client also liked the idea to have in the central access actually the park with the blue line, which means this is water. And also to reuse the wastewater, the gray water, and the storm water to be independent from the city supply and uh, sewage system. So finally, we implemented their uh, green blue infrastructure on the road scale. We can completely decouple the road runoff from the sidewalks. Uh, we use the stormwater from all plots to feed the blue line, the blue um, water system. And they have also some extra storage for reusing in their house and in their homes and in their offices for toilet flushing and other purposes and irrigation. And even in Taipei, they have 2,000 millimeter per year, but they have also periods of three weeks drawers. So they told us, yes, please, we need also cisterns. We couldn't believe that, but they told us. So they do it and they build it. And we did here the master plan and also for the first stage here for this first development here and here uh, construction uh, work and implementation yeah so if you can see how it looks like today 
And what is very nice also in Asia, the people want to understand what we are proposing. They don't really know about the green building infrastructure, what are they, what are they doing, that they do their own model, and it's a functional model, so he pump in here water, you can see how the water from the green roof is collected in the basement, then he uh, used the, reused the water for irrigation for his trees, then the road runoff comes out here with some little nozzles, is captured by the gravel trench which is underneath the sidewalk. Then we have created here a special manhole with a diffused outlet and all this they built with this uh, model to see how it works. And then he was very convinced and he said, yes, I want to have that. <laughs> he didn't look anymore on the costs. And he did it also in a real, uh, I just jump over here, in a real mock-up, finally. Because it, I think this infrastructure is uh, more and more common to combine a tree pit with a gravel trench. And of course, we can't infiltrate all because at this cloudy waves or the, the storm events, a lot of water can't be infiltrated as far, uh, fast as the water comes in. So we have a reduced outlet also to the public sewer. But we cleanse it before it goes in and we also re uh, resist and uh, delay it. And you see here how it works. Uh, we have on the end of this uh, run -ins, we have an infiltration trench. And then we have also some overflow pits where the water, which doesn't infiltrate, goes directly into these uh, tree pits. And this was a mock-up where he tested again whether it works also in reality. He, yeah, he made a cut-off here and could have a look how the drainage pipe is built in, how the substrate in the tree pit is constructed and how it works. So, thank you very much for your attention. I want to end here and uh, of course I have more projects, but maybe we do it another time. Thank you very much for your attention.